Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. We're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. It is rare that any of us have the privilege to sit down and converse with a true American hero. But each generation seems to be able to produce citizens who will step forward and do what needs to be done at the moment when the situation calls them. The generation that won World War II certainly produced their share of such heroes. We have the privilege today of sitting and talking with one of those very special Americans who responded in an extraordinary way to extraordinary circumstances. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to present Colonel Richard Condelaria. Colonel Candelaria, once again, welcome to the Western Museum flight, and let's begin by having you tell us how you got into the Air Corps. Uh, very simply, uh, from the time that I was 10 years old, I was reading about uh, the Lone Eagle and the uh, G-8 and his flying aces and the Red Baron, so I knew I wanted to be a fighter pilot, so as soon as I graduated from uh, high school, I went to enlist in the Army Air Corps at the time. Unfortunately, they said, you have to have a college degree. Well, then I had to start school. At any rate, when uh, December 7th came along and they reduced it to two years, I was able to go to the enlistment center and enlisted in the pilot program. I was sent to Nashville, which was a classification center, Nashville, Tennessee, that is. And in 10 days, I was back uh, classified as possible pilot material. I went through Santana to do the uh, pre-flight, and then my primary flight was in Oxnard, California, flying uh, P-213s, a uh, Stearman. I really enjoyed it, and from then on, uh, all of my instructors recommended me for pilot training and for fighter pilot training. So I graduated from Williams Field, Arizona, which is in Chandler, Arizona, and that's the twin engine fighter school. However, instead of going to combat as some of the other pilots, my classmates, I became an instructor. And uh, you can imagine, how I felt about not being able to go with the rest of the guys to fighter squadrons. Here I am stuck as an instructor and gnashing my teeth and tearing my hair up, but it, it turned out that might have been a good thing. Did you let your CO know about it? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, however, I was fortunate. Uh, I got a chance to find out how bad flying can be when you have a student who's uh, probably a tackle for uh, Notre Dame or USC, and he weighs 280 pounds, and I'm sitting in the back trying to wrestle the stick away from him <laughs> because he's bound and determined to kill himself and me. So uh, I learned a lot about flying, so it turned out to be a good thing. That's great. And how did you eventually get into fighter pilots? Fine. Well, uh, the call came out for fighter pilots, and I volunteered to become a fighter pilot. Uh, went to uh, uh, Louisiana, Harding Field, then from there to Colorado Springs, uh, flying uh, P-40s at the time. And I had been an instructor in p 40 so it was a piece of cake. And uh, September, I uh, was sent to England and uh, joined the 8th Air Force, the 65th Fighter Wing, the 479th Fighter Group, and the 435th Fighter Squadron as a replacement pilot. Uh, there were two of us that uh, went into that squadron. So that's how I uh, went into combat. When I got there, I was going to fly a P-38, which I had loved from the very beginning. That was my first love, P-38. I used to ride up to Mulholland Drive and look down on Burbank 
and see the P-38s taking off and landing, and I knew that's what I wanted to fly. So when I got to the squadron, they had P-38s. However, uh, about 15 days later, my squadron, the 435th, transitioned into P-51s, and I was going to lose my P-38. However, it turned out the best thing that could have happened. Although the first time I flew a P-51, uh, went down to the southern part of England, the prop ran away and the engine quit and I had to glide back to an English field. And that was my first taste of a P-51. I knew it, <laughs> I knew it could glide. <laughs> Colonel, w was that by chance a, a, a P-51B model or, or was uh, it already the D? I know it was a B model. It, it was a B, B model. It was not a D, it was a B model. Uh, it was very interesting, the first the combat mission. So approximately how long were you there uh, in England before you flew on your first combat mission? Uh, I don't recall exactly, but um, I would say about uh, seven or eight days. Wow. Mm -hmm. And uh, my first mission, uh, P-51D, uh, with tanks on. I had not flown the aircraft with tanks. So I was a wingman to the commander. And uh, as we climbed out, you usually burned out down the uh, fuselage tank, because if you didn't and you had tanks on, and you went into a turn, instead of pulling back on the stick, you were pushing the stick forward because the center of gravity changed and you might be switching ends. So wow. as a result, you know, it burned it off. Uh, we're, uh, crossing the North Sea by that time on the way to the continent and I switched on my tanks and everything was fine else and the engine quit whoops <laughs> so I called the uh, commander and as I started down and told him my engine had quit he sent someone down with me however I turned down to the main tanks and the engine started up again so I went back up in formation switched on the drop tanks and it would run for about, oh, a minute and a half. I was already in the system. Mm -hmm. So I was flying along, and the engine quit. This time, nobody went with me. But I figured out, and I know what's happening. <laughs> so I kept working the tanks until they were able to feed properly. So I flew the mission to Berlin all by myself. Every time I tried to get close to another squadron, one of the other fighter squadrons, they turned into me because I wasn't part of their squadron. They didn't know if I was one of the captured P-51s that the uh, Luftwaffe had oh. and would sneak in and take care of a bomber while they still had a chance. So as a result, I kept flying and I flew all alone all the way to Berlin. And we were just about uh, home over the North Sea and there's my squadron, so I went up and I got information. I landed with them, but nobody <laughs> knew I'd flown all alone to Berlin and back. Uh, the next uh, missions were you know, pretty normal. I, people have asked me how often was I shot at. I can't remember a mission that I wasn't shot at <laughs> because Germans were very good ground gunners, anti-aircraft gunners. Uh, you would see the flak coming up as soon as you crossed it, even if it was cloudy, and you couldn't see the land landfall in, up would come the, uh, the bursts of flak, and you knew you were now on the continent. And from then on, it was a matter of uh, diving turns, climbing turns, until you were out of range and then you'd go to the rendezvous point where the bombers were, so then you'd join up with the bombers and stay with them. Now, there were two systems in the 8th Air Force, or at least at the 65th Fighter Wing. Uh, you had a Snow White, don't laugh, Snow White squadron, and you had an outlaw squadron. The Snow White squadron had to stay with the bombers no matter what. The outlaw squadron got a chance to go hunting for them before they got to the bombers. Okay. So as a result, they had a chance to get more victories than 
the ones that were Snow White. Sometimes she were Snow White, sometimes she were Outlaw Squadron. You wanted her to be Outlaw because you wanted to go look for them. Uh, so for many missions, uh, I didn't see a thing. Off in the distance, I might see a fight, but if I was in Snow White Squadron, I had to stay with the bombers. On uh, December 5th, that changed. Was that the date of your first encounter with the enemy? Uh, that is correct. It was December 5th, and uh, we were flying Outlaw Squadron, and the group commander was leading, who was then Kyle Riddle, since uh, Colonel Zemke had gone down in bad weather and had become a prisoner. Then uh, Colonel uh, Kyle Riddle took over. He had been the first commander until he was shot down and uh, the French got him back to the, to the Allied lines and to the squadron. Uh, at any rate, uh, we were vectored toward a, a group, a gaggle of uh, enemy fighters and we saw them, and the uh, leader uh, called the bounce. The bounce was, you go attack. So we headed into them. There were about 80 plus, both Falkwolf 190s and the Messerschmitt ME 109s. It was a mixed bag. Now, I was flying wing. I was not leading. I was flying wing on uh, First Lieutenant uh, Gordon Doolittle. And we went into the middle of them, and uh, he was firing in one. I saw two uh, turning toward him, another three from the left line turning toward him. So uh, I took on the three that were on the left and shot one of those down. Then I went up to join, and I, I was attacked by the rest of them that were still in the area. However, they weren't able to get a shot on me, so. I was able to uh, break away, unfortunately, from my leader, but uh, I was under attack and I called him and told him so, but he didn't hear me because there was so much chatter. <laughs> Everybody mm -hmm. was calling everyone, and you can imagine 80 plus aircraft plus uh, our 16, and we were joined by another 16, the 434th, led by. Uh, at that time, Major Art Jeffrey, and he was the commanding officer of the 434th. At any rate, uh, uh, when I started uh, uh, engaging with the other five, why I was able to get a shot at one, and I didn't see any big strikes, but canopy came off, and next thing I know, there's, he's going by me in half-sitting position, and then I saw his parachute. Uh, stream out from him. So I knew I had him. I started to go after the other two. They went into the clouds and disappeared. And I, I went on down and started to go back up. And I looked up in the sky where there had been these hundred, you know, almost a hundred aircraft in yes. the air, including the bombers. There wasn't the soul in the sky. So I joined up with uh, a pilot from the 434th. Uh, Jacobson, Gail Jacobson from the 434th, who had been instructor with me and had gone into combat at the same time. I see. And we looked for possible targets of opportunity. Uh, however, we didn't find anything, so we, we went home, and uh, that was my, my first two kills. And the, I remember the commander at that time, it was Herb Jordan, a Major Jordan came up and he said, wow, I hear that you shot off the, once they were attacking uh, Doolittle, you shot him off his tail. Well, it wasn't quite like that. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I shouldn't have left him, but I had no choice. I was under attack. I had to protect myself. So those were my first two victories. And then from then on, it was finding uh, targets on the ground I saw, oh, I guess it was one of my first missions when two ME-262 jets, these were the jet fighters, or twin engine jet fighters, and they went right over the top of my head heading for a group of P-47s. <laughs> Before we could drop our tanks or anything, they broke off and they were gone. They were, just couldn't catch them. 
After that, I saw several uh, jets, and every time we tried to get on them, why they were able to get away from us. And I remember chasing one. Uh, he has to turn. He's got to turn. He's going to be in Russia if he doesn't turn. <laughs> you know what? He didn't turn. <laughs> so I had to go back, you know, and join the uh, the squadron, which was pretty well split up by then. Anyway, uh, I lost uh, two aircraft, as a matter of fact. They were uh, D models. And uh, I lost them to... Uh, while strafing airfields. Again, as the uh, Germans pulled back, they brought their guns back with them. So you got a concentration of more and more anti-aircraft guns, and they were good. I have nothing but respect for those anti-aircraft uh, gunners. Yes, they were we've, we've read I don't like them, but <laughs> I respect them. <laughs> Yes, we've read about those deadly German 88 millimeter flat guns. Oh, yeah, oh, And they yeah. had plenty of practice using them. Oh, man, were they good. So, so, Colonel, typically when you return from an escort mission, yes. after engaging in combat maneuvers yes. and so on, approximately how much fuel did you have left in the tanks after you landed? Uh, it depended. It depended on the mission, how long you were out. Now, it turns out that the uh, P-51 with the Merlin engine was miserly. We burned uh, no, about uh, two-thirds of the fuel, or half of the fuel, at a P-47. And we were traveling at uh, 300 on economy, 300 miles an hour. But uh, at combat crews, which as soon as you went to battle formation, which the leader would call out battle formation, everybody would spread out. Why? Uh, then you'd kick it up to uh, 300 and about 376, 75 miles an hour. At that okay. point, you were still burning under 50 gallons of fuel per hour, whereas the pretty seven, the P-47 was uh, burning uh, close to 100 <laughs> gallons per hour. Uh, it was a miserly engine, but it was a very good engine. When I got my after I lost one, I made it to uh, Belgium, and uh, gosh, everything was fine, uh, except I was badly shot up and the engine was surging, and I, the only way I could keep it going was to use a system, which is uh, the primer pump. I was yes. pumping fuel with a primer pump. My hand was getting tired, but I made it to a field in Belgium, and uh, I went in to land, everything was fine, put the gear down, went down and touched down and rolling forward and all of a sudden the gear collapsed. Oh. And I'm skidding down the runway. I, fortunately, the blades of the propeller bend back and they form a skid, so I was skidding down and finally stopped. And uh, one of the ground crew had picked up this huge, which he couldn't do normally by himself, he picked it up, had run, and was pointing <laughs> the extinguisher at me. I said, no, no, I'm okay. I was not on fire, so I got out. Now, they said, well, you landed wheels up. I said, no, I didn't. I put the gear down. Uh, Look at the handle. It's down. Yeah. Uh, what saved me was the tail wheel re also retracts, unlike other aircraft. The tail yes. wheel retracts at a P-51. Right. Well, the tail wheel was out, so that meant that the gear was down. What had happened is the hydraulic system had been shut out, and the gears that in the doors usually close as soon as you touch down. The gears, the doors close okay. to streamline it. But at any rate, uh, the doors were down, doors which were meant down. the hydraulic system had been damaged, and that's why the gear collapsed. So, but I left an airplane there and took somebody else's airplane. And the crew chiefs, sorry, crew chiefs, but once in a while you guys make mistakes. They had reversed the trim tabs, so mm. so instead of helping, you know, I put in the trim tabs for takeoff, and everything's not working and working the opposite. So I figured it out and turned around and used the trim tabs in the opposite direction. Anyway, I got home. And that worked. Yeah, yeah that worked. 
Can you tell us about life on the base and what were maybe some of your primary concerns? Uh, uh, how, how did weather affect mission scheduling? What was the serviceability of the available aircraft, etc.? Every airplane that could fly would fly when it was a maximum effort, which meant there were a thousand bombers and all of the uh, fighter aircraft that could get in the air. Now, on normal days, why they, uh, you flew 16 aircraft out instead of the 24 or five. Uh, weather. England is a great place. And the whole summer, it's great, all three weeks of it. The rest of the time, oh man, uh, the fog comes in and I, very few days do you have the word, it's open, but there are some, mm -hmm. which in a way was bad. Anyway, uh, we would take off and go into the soup, immediately go on instruments and fly out to the continent. Now remember, this was most of my combat was during the winter time. And during the winter time, the continent has clouds, many, many clouds. It's hardly ever clear. Coming right. back was a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> what would happen is you might have a 500 or 800 or even 1,000 feet and maybe a half a mile of visibility. Wow. And you'd be coming down, coming into land, and of course you didn't have all the fuel in the world, but you had enough fuel to land. So the procedure was to hit the end of the runway at full speed, that is at cruising speed, in case there was a fog wally in the pattern. So you would hit the, uh, the end of the runway and peel up to lose uh, airspeed, gain enough altitude to the run, come down, and at the last minute while you would level off and hit the runway. Yes. Uh, now, when it was socked in, as we call it, they would send up a mortar shell, a mortar flare would go up, and that's where the end of the runway was. So you would break there and turn around and work your way down to the last minute if if the runway was there, you would then level it off and find the end of the runway and touch down. It helped when uh, at the end of the runway they were firing flares to let you know that was the end of the runway. But a lot of times you didn't see the runway until, oh, maybe two or three seconds before you touched down. Wow. So it was not the best of things. However, most of the time you had anywhere from... Uh, 500 feet to maybe two or 3,000 feet, and of course that was not a problem then. Right, right. But so, everyone was sucked in. No, so you mentioned that there were some occasions where enemy aircraft would f follow you home, or follow American aircraft back to, back to England and try to get into the pattern and shoot down one or two. Uh, oh yeah, the, uh, mostly uh, I would say uh, by 1945, no, but in 1944, yes. Uh, and you had another worry because uh, the anti-air aircraft of the British, you remember, they had the doodle bugs or the, the V-1s for oh, the yes. flying bombs. Yes. The British called them doodle bugs. Why they call them that, I don't know. Anyway, if you were at 300 miles an hour and you were at low altitude, the British would be shooting at you. So what you try to do was stay above uh, the deck and uh, keep your speed up. So at the last minute you had to break your speed and uh, as I say, go down and uh, do your pitch up as we called it. And we would fan out and everybody would line up and finally go in on the runway. A couple of times I had to go up and bring some of my flight down when I became a flight commander because I'd been an instrument instructor, and I had a lot of weather experience. That's where that yeah. <laughs> short time as an instructor helped a great deal. And in fact, uh, many times uh, they would all join up on me, and I'd keep retarding the throttle, return, well, you know, get ahead of me. <laughs> I'm not leading. <laughs> no, they were hanging in there because they knew I'd get them home. <laughs> so, oh, that was... Uh, 
that was interesting. Now, when these uh, doodle bugs or the V1s were flying, you had to be super careful because the British didn't pay attention to radio calls or anything. If something was flying low and it was under 300 miles an hour, they were shooting at it, no matter what kind of an insignia you had. So you had to be careful about the British. Several times we were vectored up to the 5th or 4th to uh, uh, to a naval base, Scape Flow, that's in the northern part of England. Man, is it far north. And uh, it might be open, or enough uh, ceiling so you could land. And uh, twice we were vectored into France, and we landed in France, and then we got orders. The teletype always worked. We got orders to rendezvous with the bombers, and we'd take off from France instead of, but without tanks. Okay. Uh, without tanks, and uh, fly to the rendezvous with the bombers. So we always escorted the bombers out. One of the reasons that uh, Colonel Zemke, you know, he had, uh, I think it was 19 uh, victories with the uh, 56th Fighter Group when he was a commander of the 56th. Yes. And he came uh, to our group and took over. Um, he had two more victories, as a matter of fact. I think that's what brought him up to 19. And the weather was really, really bad over the continent. And the bombers got the recall, and the fighters did too. And one group of bombers evidently didn't hear the recall, so they kept on going. And it was this kind of weather where you could see other aircraft, but you couldn't see a horizon. There was no horizon. So you had to fly in instruments. And yes. these bombers kept plowing on, so Zenki said, well, if they have guts enough to go to the target, we have guts enough to go with them. And unfortunately, that's when we lost him, because several of them, uh, in fact, we lost four, three from the uh, 434th and uh, one from the 435th. Do you recall if Colonel Zemke was hit by ground fire or was negative. he engaged in air combat? Ne negative. He was not hit. There was no ground fire at that moment. No, uh, uh, either his instruments froze up or he misjudged and spun out. All of a sudden, you know, the controls are getting very, very loose. <laughs> I, and being an instructor, I know what that slide where students put me through mm -hmm. it. And I said, so there's something wrong at about that time why like everybody started spinning and I pulled out of the spin and here come some tanks flying down because you lose your tanks as soon as you start spinning and you should of course. Yes. Anyway, uh, one of the pilots who had been instructor with me, Richard Creighton from Pasadena, California, as a matter of fact, uh, he uh, was sent to the hospital because he pulled out at the last minute and he pulled nine and a half G's, and wow. you know, the accelerometer tells you how many G's you have pulled. So uh, no one had pulled that many G's before, and the uh, airplane was bent a little, but not too badly. <laughs> <laughs> but they sent him to the hospital. No, he was fine. <laughs> but I remember that vividly, and I remember pulling out myself, and here come. I had to pull out twice out of a spin because airplanes kept going by me and tanks and so on. Anyway, uh, some of us got home and some didn't. We lost Lieutenant Colonel, oh gosh, Heron was his name. And uh, he was a deputy uh, group commander. I and mean, we lost, you know, we lost uh, two captains, a lieutenant colonel and a major. And all the second lieutenants came home. <laughs> we didn't lose a single as I can read that. Goes to show you. <laughs> yes. As you as you get more experience, you get worse. <laughs> well, when you're up front leading the pack as well, yeah. right? <laughs> right. So, Colonel, typically on an outbound mission, uh, what would your cruising speed be with with drop tanks, with full load of fuel and ammo, mm -hmm. uh, flying above the bombers? Uh, well, you uh, flew at 300 miles an hour until you hit landfall in and you went into battle formation. 
Yep. Our particular group went at 370, uh, yeah, 370 miles an hour, sometimes at 340. Why? Because you were in battle formation, you were expecting to fight. Now, the good thing about the Mustang was as soon as you push that throttle forward, it jumped forward. And if you dropped the nose with full throttle, you were at... Uh, at the terminal of velocity for the P-51. Now here's something that was peculiar to a P-51. Anyone who's flown yes. that knows this. As you approach the speed of sound, about 525 miles an hour before you get to the speed of sound, of course, at Mach, say, 0.9, the aircraft becomes to porpoise. Why? Because the airflow goes over the wing, gives you lift, and then it piles up no lift. Now, it's doing the same thing to the horizontal stabilizer. Okay. So the stabilizer's doing this, so the nose is doing this, so you start to porpoise, and you'd better pull back on the throttle, and prop acts as a brake, actually. As you pull back on the throttle, then you can gain control, because otherwise it'll porpoise until maybe the tail comes off, and that had happened that and happened. did happen to some uh, but at any rate, that particular maneuver, which is peculiar to the P-51, saved my life probably. But that's another story. Yes. Well, Colonel, so far so good. Uh, can you tell us if you experienced any instances where in the wild combat maneuvering and pulling high Gs and so on, did you have any instances where the guns jammed? Negative. Not once. And that was because Sergeant Goring, who was going to become very important later on, Sergeant Goring, instead of sleeping in a very, we lived on an RAF base, a permanent RAF base, so we lived in the officers club, and then they had these nice houses for the ground crews. And instead of that, he would go to the revetment where the aircraft was parked, and there would be these big engine boxes, and he put two of them together, and he would sleep there to make sure that he would load the guns at the last minute and make sure they were bore sighted. So that by the time I got there to get into the airplane, the guns were gonna be perfect. Every time I pulled on the trigger, the guns fired. Others had problems, I never did. That's great, you were, you were fortunate you had a dedicated crew chief. Oh. Well, it wasn't the crew chief, it was the armor in the this armor. case. But I had a very good crew chief also. I'll tell you about him later. Now, tell us a little bit, Colonel, about what life was like in between missions on the Bo base. Boring. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, yeah. First of all, some were glad they weren't on the mission. Some of us were anxious because we wanted victories. You know, if you're a fighter right, pilot, right. you wanna you wanna fight. Right. You're in a fighter, why are you in a fighter? <laughs> you're supposed to fight. And exactly. how are you gonna get a victory? If you don't find a target, you don't get into a fight, you're never gonna get any victories. Everyone wants to become an ace. You know, it's part of being a fighter pilot. Exactly. Uh, yes. Now, you, some would play uh, baseball and all that, and uh, uh, every chance I got, uh, I would uh, fly as spare, even if it was one of the other squadron on several occasions. I flew with the 434th and not with my squadron, which is the 435th. And I flew as a spare, and when you get to a certain point and no one has aborted, because some would have to abort because of problems of the aircraft, right. and then you take his place. So, you know, you're hoping that somebody aboards, but if they didn't, and you were released, I'd keep going, because <laughs> <laughs> I'd keep going. Now you could find targets of opportunity, so now you were alone, you didn't have to, you didn't have to be under somebody, under the leader you're telling you what to do. So you go down and look for locomotives, tanks, trucks, uh, you, you never shot at baby buggies, however, that's not true. No one ever <laughs> packed prams or off limits. But anything that moved, you shot at. And uh, I, I can remember several times uh, I was able to get uh, 
not often a tank, but very often a locomotive, and uh, the, the civilian would spill out, you know, and, and they'd think you were going to strafe them, but, you know, you'd see colors, and, well, they're civilians, they're, they're not uh, uh, army people, so you'd leave them alone. Yes, and we've seen but some it, pretty dramatic footage, a documentary <laughs> film of oh, the yeah. uh, locomotives that blowing up. Oh, and, yeah. You know, You'd love to see that. <laughs> yes. And you usually only had to uh, make one pass. Uh, sometimes you had to make two, but hardly ever. But uh, I saw something very strange. P-47 had eight 50 caliber machine guns right. firing uh, APIs, armor-piercing incendiaries. I saw two of them going down in one train from the side. And when they fired... You saw the hits, and it tipped it over. I said, wow, I don't want to get in front of a P-47. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, that, I never saw us do it, but I saw those two P-47s wow. do it, so I, I have respect for them. Yeah, so those uh, 850 calibers pack a lot of punch. Oh, yes. Yes, they do. Uh, uh, people don't realize it, but uh, yes, they do. Now, Colonel, can you tell us a little more about the mission where you achieved A status? Uh, yes, it was, uh, oh my. How did the day begin? <laughs> All right, uh, normal day, uh, you didn't have breakfast. Uh, what happened is they would come and they would wake you up. By the way, we lived in the club and there were two of us in a room. Some had three, but we had two in the room. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would come down the hall and wake up the pilots that were supposed to fly because we had enough pilots that everyone flew every mission. Okay. Uh, and they used to have a bet. Who was going to come to the door and find me still asleep? I was always sitting up because I could hear them coming to the hall. So I was sitting up. <laughs> missed it again. Uh, at any rate, that day... Uh, uh, normal, got up and uh, went to the briefing room. You went to the briefing room first, were briefed as to where they were going, where the bombers and we were going to be escorting the second air division, which was B-24 Liberators. And we liked that because they didn't fly as high as the B-17s. The forts used to go up to 35,000 feet, whereas the B-24s would anywhere from 16 to 25,000 feet. Okay. And why, I don't know. However, they were faster than the uh, B-17s. They were uh, close to uh, 200, whereas the B-17s were at 150. Okay. Uh, so we preferred that because you'd have to go do a racetrack pattern or S back and forth over the bombers because you right. were so much faster right. than they were. Uh, went to the briefing room, found out where we were going, and uh, what our position was. And I was going to be leading the second section. Uh, there was white, red, yellow, and blue. And I was leading the second section, uh, so I would have eight aircraft, eight aircraft under my command. Oh, then you didn't go to the, uh, to the club to the dining room, you went to the squadron ready room, and they had a kitchen there. And our ground crews are great people. They would go and they would trade with the farmers and get fresh eggs. Hmm. Now, <laughs> in the dining room, you, you got powdered eggs. <laughs> they didn't taste quite as good, but again, in the ready room, you could count on fresh eggs. That's great. So, you... Uh, went to, had breakfast, and then put on your equipment. Of course, you had to have your uniform on. You always flew with uniform. And uh, then you put on your flight suit and your anti-G suit and your boots, uh, whatever type of boots. I like the fur line the boots. The fur line boots. Yeah. And uh, you would take your equipment. You always had a little knife that you had in your sleeve. Why? Why would you have a little knife? Well, real simple. 
You sat on a dinghy, you had a backpack for a parachute. You didn't sit on your parachute. It was backpack. You had a dinghy and sometimes it would inflate. Why? Who knows? <laughs> but it would inflate and then you'd be pressed up against the canopy and you couldn't reach the rudders. So that little dog you had to puncture it. You punctured it at home. You were back to normal. However, if you fell in the water, they wouldn't have a dinghy. Mm -hmm. It didn't make much difference because the Palmer pilots, thank goodness they had this, they had big rafts and they could, the aircraft would float for a while, a bomber, because of the size, I guess, would float. Yes. Whereas the fighter, uh, it would either hit it nose in or it would skip and go nose in. It didn't stay afloat. So you had to get into your dinghy. Most of the time you were not able to, and even if you did, you were already wet. And you had 20 minutes before uh, you got too cold. If you were in the function. water. You were, if, you were, if you got in the water, yeah. unlikely. Now, they were only able to save one of our pilots that fell into the water. And he got out of the plane in time to get into the dinghy. He was, but he was already soaked. <laughs> and then the dinghy <laughs> tipped. He fell right in front of a British destroyer, and they had no choice. They had to pick him up. <laughs> so they picked him up and put blanks around him. And as you know, the British had uh, rum aboard, so they fed him rum and brandy. He was just fine. He was happy as when he got back to the squadron. Uh, however, that's the reason that you had that knife. Now, I always carried a hunting knife in my boot, anyway, with a nice big. Not my Bowie knife, but a real mm -hmm. good hunting mm -hmm. knife. I had that, and I had my little knife here. And did you and also have a 45 caliber pistol? Yes, you, uh, you always flew with the, oh, I forgot to tell you about that. Uh, yes, well, that's when you got into the aircraft. Just before you got in the aircraft, you had a shoulder holster, and it sat right here over this breast pocket. Okay. Yeah, right there. Now, bad thing that day, I didn't have any, I only had, I think two roll, uh, these, uh, gosh, I forgot the name of them, but uh, the blanket type uh, uniforms. I had my pinks and greens. Well, I loved the, <laughs> the uh, uniform that we had in those days. So I had a yes. brand new green shirt. Uh, you know, it was very dark green. Okay. And my pink trousers, They're really gray with a tinge of pink. So they were called pinks. Uh, but that was a brand new shirt. I'd only worn it once. And I'd had it cleaned and I was all nice and clean. And I put on my flight suit and uh, went out to the airplane. And see, the cowling is off. Uh-oh. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to go. And the crew chief said his name was Mueller, <laughs> Leslie Mueller. I had Goring and Mueller. I said, <laughs> Are you sure you aren't flying for the Luftwaffe? <laughs> no, no, they're Americans. This becomes very important for that particular mission because I climbed into the aircraft, I started up, and uh, we got the signal to get to the runway, so I started to taxi out. I was going down the runway, and the tower called me. And uh, they said, uh, yellow leader, uh, you have a flat tail wheel. Pull over to the side. <laughs> so I pulled over to the side and shut off the engine. And I was about to get out of the airplane. Thinking, um, here, I'm leading, and I'm sure it's going to be a good day now. That particular day, the sun was shining in England mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, did a couple of foolish things. Anyway, I had taken my jacket and instead of wearing it, I put it under my seat. <laughs> if I land in Brussels, I'll have a jacket. If I land anywhere, I'll have a jacket. I'll just reach down and put it on, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's going to happen to me. Oh, I got into the airplane taxed it out and again, I ran up. Here comes Mueller and Goring and uh, one other. And they said, don't get up, don't get up, stay in there. Uh -huh. 
Well, I sat back down, tail came up. Oh, a minute later, tail came down. And they said, and they were ready to start me up. So I started the engine. By that time, as I started going toward the runway, I saw the last two, we took off in elements of two, mm -hmm. making a turn, and they were disappearing into the overcast, which had been real nice in the morning. Now it was overcast. They went into the overcast and disappeared. So yes. I went charging down. You weren't supposed to do this, but I went charging down to the runway, and I didn't pay attention to the flagman who's supposed to tell you when to go. <laughs> <laughs> I knew there was nobody in front of me, so I went down the runway check, checking the mags on the runway. Uh, I got airborne, and I turned, and of course, how am I going to find them? They're in the clouds. They're, I know where they're going. I know the track, but I might run into one of them. You're right. So I took a couple of degrees off. I knew where the rendezvous point was, so I headed there. Now, I didn't have to worry about throttling back to make sure everybody was keeping up, so I wanted maximum uh, power after climbing up. Right. And I had an aeroprop, the P-51K model, had an aeroprop instead of the Hamilton Standard, yeah. which was uh, hydraulically operated. The aeroprop industries was a contoured prop instead of a flat, like what I call the paddle wheel. Yes. And it reacted, well, it was operated electrically, so it's very quick. And it outclimbed. Not it was more than maybe ten miles an hour faster, but it could could have climbed the others. Oh. So I climbed up to altitude of still in the clouds and I broke out over Belgium and, and there's Holland. Ah. Oh. And I can see the bombers up ahead. So I went to the rendezvous point and I was five minutes ahead of everyone. Oh. <laughs> oh, I'm and I went down and I looked down at the markings. Oh, sure, that's the ones we're supposed to escort. That's our, those are our two groups. So I started, uh, stayed there, and I told them I was at the rendezvous point. I called my squadron and told them I was at the rendezvous point. And, okay, we'll join you. And, but it was at least five minutes or longer. And as I'm going up and down, I see these two ME-262, these jet fighters. Yes. Mission 260, well, all of you know what an ME is. Uh, 262s, and they're coming toward the bombers. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, I called them out to the squadron and told them I have two jets uh, coming toward the formation. Well, the only thing I could do was go at them head on. There was, there was no other way. I was Once I let them go past me, they'd hit the bombers. So I would yes. have them head on and now they had 30 millimeter cannon in the nose and I had 50 calibers, but I wasn't thinking. <laughs> A lot of times I didn't think. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I went at them head on to get them to bear and sure enough, uh, as they came toward me, I thought, oh, they're gonna go because he dropped his nose just slightly, just enough to go under me I'll drop my tanks on them. So I toggled off the tanks, <laughs> and, and of course it missed them, but it made the leader turn just enough, and at their speed they made a big wide turn. Now, I had a lot of speed by then. I was at about five, five or five, five by that time. I was able to cut across, and I was able to get on the leader just enough he was pulling away from me. So I put the sight on him, and then I elevated now. When I was very young, I had a, first I had a, an air rifle and a daisy air rifle, and, and then I had a 22. so I was to shooting. And uh, in fact, I won a championship in the 8th Air Force for uh, skeet shooting, so I knew how to pull lead, and I knew distances just automatically. So I just raised the sight enough and I fired, and I saw hits on him, and black smoke started coming out of the left engine and puffs of smoke out of the right engine. Yes. But I thought I hit the canopy, but evidently I, I didn't, or if I did, they had very good uh, armor plating, by the way. Uh, a lot of things that the Germans had are really good. 
I fired, yes. I saw the hits, I saw, then he made a slow turn and started down into a vertical drive. So I'm trying to go after him. Right. Now, his wingman had gotten behind me. And I, as I was starting trying to get to him, why I hit the terminal velocity, guess what? <laughs> Airplane started to porpoise. At the same time, I saw these tennis balls, glowing tennis balls, going over the, my right wing. I <laughs> looked in the mirror, because my crew chief had put mirrors, most of the crew chiefs did, two little mirrors, and I see this ME-262, and his nose is lit up like a Z, <laughs> like a big fat sign. <laughs> uh, he was firing me, and the only thing I felt was a, just a little bit of a jolt. He took off the right uh, wing, the navigation light, and a piece of the right wing, but no real damage. Mm -hmm. But, of course, that forced me to yank the throttle back, which I had to do because the aircraft was pumped. I right. can imagine that poor German pilot said, wow, what kind of a pilot is that? <laughs> <laughs> trying to throw off his aim. <laughs> right. <laughs> so anyway, I pulled the throttle back and broke hard left, and of course I lost a lot of speed, and I saw him going toward the clouds also. There's no way I could catch him. And I saw the first one enter the undercast in a vertical drive, and the undercast was about 6,000 feet. So later when they asked me, well, did you see the pilot bail out? No, I didn't. Did you see the canopy cut off? No, I didn't. Did you see him hit the ground? No, I didn't. <laughs> he went into the clouds, that's all I saw. Mm -hmm. Oh, gee, that's too bad. It's pro uh, probable then. <laughs> okay, you know, if it's a probable, that's what it is. Right. It didn't look like he was going to be going no, home. That's right. So, well, no sense in staying with him. And I started back toward the bombers. And uh, then I saw they were firing flares, which meant that they were under a, attack or possibly under attack. So I went through a little bank of clouds and I say, as I broke out and headed back up toward the bombers. I had, at that point, plenty of speed. And I was up above the bombers in no time. And I saw what I thought was, gee, hot dog, look at all those black crosses. <laughs> and I thought, wait a minute, there's 15 of them, <laughs> and I'm all alone. <laughs> so I, I called the uh, squadron, and they said, we're almost there. We're just uh, a minute or less away. Where, well, where are you? And I said, well, I'm right in the middle of a, a bunch of 109s. I, and I saw what I knew was the leader because it was a strange formation. I hadn't seen that formation before. Now, instead of being uh, a lead and uh, two wingmen or a lead element leader, a wingman and a wingman on the leader, you know, the four that we flew, which was you know, finger, finger formation, formation, right? No. There was five. There was one leader and uh, four behind him. Okay. And there were three of them. But the lead fellow, he had a yellow nose that went from the windshield all the way to the spinner. Bright yellow. This guy wow. wanted to be seen. The others had <laughs> camouflage. Not, not this one. It should have given me a clue. Anyway, I, I figured, well, the only thing I can do is take on the leader. If I take the leader, maybe by that time the others will get here and uh, I can keep them away from the bombers. There were still quite a ways from the bombers. So uh, I went after the leader. I should have looked at all the victory bars on his uh, tail. <laughs> and was this pilot good? He made a fool out of me. You know, every time I'd start to get lead on him, he'd lose me. I'd have to start all over and work him out in front of me again, and then he'd lose me again. And one of these times that he lost me, he broke away, and we were close enough to the bombers. He would over and I shot out two engines of one of the B-24s, <laughs> and I was right with him, and I couldn't fire at him because he, I would be hitting the bombers. Right. And on the other hand, his group couldn't fire at me because I was too close to him. Or at least that's what I think. 
I could be wrong. At right. any way, at that point, I again engaged him, and he led me in a merry chase. This guy was really good. I had no business tangling with him, but anyway. Uh, finally, I got a chance to get some lead on him, and I hit him, and he all of a sudden coolant started coming, and then his engine caught fire, and he went spiraling down. I kept going after him, and I saw the canopy come off this time, and he bailed out, and I saw the parachute stream out behind him, and then I knew he, he was okay, and I went past him and turned around, and uh, I look back and, oh man, it's a hornet's nest because there's, there's 14 others, right, you know, coming after me. So uh, again, we engaged and each time that uh, I thought I, I had another shot, why I'd see tracers going past me and the ME-109 had four machine guns, but it had a cannon a uh, 20 millimeter cannon firing out the spinner. Spinner, okay. And uh, you and now those look like golf balls. The 30 millimeters look like tennis balls. These are glowing golf balls, and you see one out of five. <laughs> and I'd see these, and I'd have to break one way or another. Uh, I finally got a chance to hit one of them. Uh, then I saw about four right behind me. Oh, no. So I pulled to the right. The ME-109 and any single engine aircraft has torque because the propeller is turning in such a way that you have to always use right rudder if you're low speed. At high speed, it turns around the other way. I chopped the throttle and pulled to the right, which I knew would help me pull to the right. And then I snapped into the to the left, and instead of turning, I skidded. I cross-controlled, and I buried the rudder, but I kept the ailerons in a level condition, so it, the airplane just skidded, and it came around, and these went on by me, and then the next ones, they were behind them. I was able to get right on them, so I got a good shot and got another one down. Uh, then I, I don't remember everything that happened because it was just like a big ball. Right, a big fur ball. And I kept going after one, and I'd have to break off because a couple more were on my tail. And uh, at any rate, I, you know, I kept going. I kept calling the squad, and they said, where are you, where are you? And I looked up. I said, I'm right under the bombers. I could look at a map. <laughs> you know, I'm too busy. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm right on to the bombers. And I, then I realized the bomber street goes for almost 100 miles. <laughs> but and it, then they saw what blow up. And they said, we see you now, we see you. And about that time, uh, another one hit the ground. So they were able to see the, well, they saw three going down. And, and as they got there, I guess the others saw these, uh, there were seven. I was missing, which I should have been leading, and the others uh, had, of course, been with a the squadron. There were seven of them, and I guess the uh, uh, the rest of the one and I started, if we're having this much trouble with the one guy, what are we gonna do with seven Mustangs? <laughs> so they went into the cloud bank, and uh, unfortunately for me, it was uh, Lieutenant Barsky, uh, George Williams, who flew my wing the rest of the way, uh, King, uh, Sauls, Heathman, gosh, I don't remember, oh, Rudat, uh, I think that's all I can remember. At any rate, uh, they went down and they counted the burning wreckage on the ground, so I had confirmation. I didn't have a confirmation on the jet, however. Uh, I see. Now, it turns out that uh, a historian, aviation historian, had it in with the German uh, people that had the records. And yes. sure enough, the left engine was on fire when he came down, but he was able to make a, a wheels up landing. He, mm. The hydraulic system had been shot away. He couldn't lower his wheels and the engine was on fire, but he was able to actually get out of the airplane. And uh, 
later on they restored the airplane, didn't fly again, but it could have. Wow. Uh, uh, at that point, why uh, George Williams joined on my wing and we flew onto the target. And now everybody was getting short on fuel because we dropped our tanks, yes. and which still had fuel, but we had to drop them because we were going to engage the enemy. Uh, so we left uh, on the way back at landfall out uh, as we hit the North Sea why we went ahead and the other state with the bombers and we went ahead and uh, went back to the what to the watership airfield and I did another dumb thing now I didn't know what damage I would suffered you right. know because I'm sitting in the cockpit I don't know what's happening and I couldn't help it. I just couldn't resist it. I went in the uh, slow rolls over the field, victory rolls. Victory rolls, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they come at us. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, all the damage I had was uh, the right part of the right wing was gone, and uh, there were just a few bullet holes in the uh, empennage. But uh, other than that, I didn't have any real damage. Oh, now, if it hadn't been for Sergeant Mueller and Sergeant Goring, I'd have never had that mission. I'd have never had those batteries. That's why those two ground crew were so important. Yes. They kept me from, <laughs> uh, from being grounded, you might say. Yes, yes, wow. So it must have been... Uh an amazingly exhilarating feeling to come home and survive yeah. that air battle. Yes, yeah. and as I taxied out, now the ground people, of course, look at your guns and see when you take off, your guns are taped over the barrel. Okay. And uh, if they see that the tape is broken, that means you've been in, either you've had targets or uh, you were firing at ground uh, targets, but yes. maybe you uh, you had some action. So whenever they see that, they all start coming out and cheering and all that. As I went by, I couldn't help but he go, oh, I got four. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I had five, but uh, yes. yeah, it turned out that uh, one was uh, probable. And did your crew chief paint the victories on the side of your plane? Yes, he did. Oh, yes, Great. immediately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I no sooner uh, was climbing out, uh, as a matter of really neat, I had a ground crew that was so great. When I could get back from a mission, especially if it was a long mission, like say six or seven hours, uh, they'd try to help me out of the cockpit. Now, yeah, I was in my 20s, I could get out of the cockpit, but no, no, they <laughs> <laughs> they'd help me out and help me down to the ground. <laughs> what happened? What happened? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, six, seven hours in the cockpit, you can get a little bit stiff. Yeah. Well, I can remember logging six hours and 55 minutes on one mission. This mission, we went to Prague in Czechoslovakia, so it was a long mission. We had other very long missions, but I remember that one. Yes. Well, all of this occurred... Or you know, this action you, you just described, Colonel, occurred um, in April of 1945. That's right. Just approximately a month or so before war's end. Uh, yes, that's about right. April 7th. Yeah, and I was, uh, gosh, it was May, May 9th, wasn't it? That, uh, May 8th or 9th, yes, yeah, for the end of the war yeah. in Europe. Yeah, I wish I had known that it was going to end then. Yes, wow. Uh, and, Colonel, in many instances, um, did you have gun camera film to look at after uh, oh, yes. returning from the you mission? Always, you always did. Now, one, fortunately, somebody saw it <laughs> and could confirm yes. it. I'm firing in a Falco 190 right in front of me, and I can see him. There's uh, contrails coming out behind him on that uh, December 5th mission, the contrails. Yes. But I could see him, and I could see the rounds, and I could see him burst into flame and all that. The gun camera is in the wing, 
and it was in the contrail. And all you can see is the, fa the wing tips of the airplane. <laughs> the wing, then all of a sudden, why, you see the airplane, but it's already on fire. But you don't see the hits as I did. Yes. <laughs> and, and fortunately, again, you know, I had confirmation. A different view of the victory, yes. Yes. And, but and, uh, yes, we used to look at the uh, film, and even if uh, we didn't get a victory, if we engaged, uh, and also uh, the ground, we want to know if we did any damage on the ground, because I remember my crew chief coming to me, and he said, uh, I was a lieutenant, I wasn't a captain yet, and a lieutenant, could you come over here? Well, sure. Well, you see all those holes? Yes. <laughs> uh, I sure hope you're putting some hurt on those other guys, because I gotta <laughs> patch all those <laughs> uh, I said, I think I did. <laughs> well, Colonel, thank you so much for being our special guest today and sharing this amazing story. It's, uh, you know, an action-packed adventure that, you know, would be hard-pressed to be beat by any Hollywood scriptwriter. Yeah. And, uh, you know, thank you for your service, and uh, uh, this time I'd like to see if maybe we may have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, before we go into that, may yes. I have one last Yes, say? yes. Uh, now, you couldn't get me into a bomber. Uh, there's no way I could be a bomber pilot, especially after I saw what I saw. But I have nothing but respect for all bomber crews because I saw them coming home in pieces, literally, you know, chunks gone, two engines gone, smoking, uh, uh, part of the rudder going, in the case of the B-24s, the whole rudder gone, and they're fighting their way home. They're you're still fighting, and they're in pieces. It's too bad the American people didn't get to see their, their bomber crews and doing what they did because uh, some of them didn't make it. You know, some went into the uh, into the North Sea. By the way, the North Sea, that water is coming down from the Arctic, and it is cold, cold, cold. And again. I have nothing but respect. I also have respect for the German gunners, and I have respect for the German pilots. But you know, they were fighting for their country, and we were fighting for ours. Now I do realize that uh, they had, uh, some of them had 10, and, uh, or at least some of the ones I tangled with, because later on I found out who they were. Uh, they had 10 to eight to six years of experience in combat. And we were novices. This, sometimes it was the first time we were in combat. Certainly was for me. So uh, again, I have a lot of respect for them because uh, they did their best. <laughs> now they even rammed the bombers. You know, if they couldn't shoot them down, they would ram the bombers. But anyway, that's uh, another story for some other time. Yes. Okay, we can take a couple of questions from the audience. Colonel, the question is regarding the attributes of the P-51D Mustang and the, all the opponents that it came up against, the ME-109, the FW-190, etc. What particular features allowed the P-51D to be so much more superior to the enemy that it encountered? Well, I'm not sure it was that superior. However, it did have some advantages. That Merlin engine was a super engine and uh, you could uh, accelerate and decelerate rather quickly. Uh, also, it didn't have as much torque for whatever reason in a right turn when you had full throttle as either the 109 or the 190. Uh, the 190 had a faster rate of roll than the P-51D, or the K, or the B. Uh, the B was slightly faster than the D model. Uh, the K was just barely a little faster. Uh, the D model was the one that was used mostly, and it had most of the victories uh, after, oh, I would say after 
1943. The P 51 would accelerate rapidly. Uh, it also could decelerate rapidly. Uh, and the laminar flow wing uh, gave it an advantage at high altitude and at low altitude. Now, it didn't have a turbo supercharger that the P-38 had or the P-47. It had a mechanical uh, supercharger and it would cut in at 14,000 feet, which always gave you a big surprise because <laughs> you'd have the be advancing the throttle, advancing the throttle to get the manifold pressure up, and then all of a sudden it would cut in and it would go wang, <laughs> and you had to immediately uh, retard the throttle. Now, the turning ability of the P-51 was slightly better. One of the things that helped it, and I did use it, uh, the flaps on the P-51, it had notches for 10 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees, 40 degrees, or full flaps. And it had a handle that uh, you pushed down. Now, if you wanted full flaps, you just slap the handle down. Now, the good thing about it was that if you were in combat and you were above 200 miles an hour, you could slap that handle all the way down. The flaps would only come down 20 degrees, which would give you extra lift. And therefore, you could outturn uh, the 190 or the 109. Now, it depended also on the pilot. If the 109 or the 190 were very experienced pilots, why, uh, you had a very slight edge, but it still was an edge. So again, you could put down flaps at above 200 miles an hour, three or 400 miles an hour, but the flaps would only come down 20%, and that gave you enough lift to outturn most of the fighters and most of the pilots. Colonel, the question is, how helpful was the K-14 gyro gun sight in aiding the firing of the guns and shooting at the enemy? It was a great improvement over the fixed sight. However, at times I had to use the fixed sight because the K-14 wouldn't catch up fast enough. But uh, all you had to do was put that uh, pipper right on, the, uh, right on the cockpit. And if you had the right wingspan for the aircraft that you were uh, engaged with, uh, it would give you the proper lead. It had a very slight, uh, well, you had to give it a little time to uh, one or two seconds and we'll catch up. It was an excellent sight. I, I approve of it. <laughs> Colonel, the question is, on the April 7th, 1945 mission, did you see any German fighters ram at the bombers? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, you almost never saw uh, ME-262, the jets, ram the bombers. If any of them ram was usually a propeller-driven aircraft. Uh, however, in the distance, after the engagement was over, the bomber was still heading for the target. And up ahead of me, oh, a good, oh, well, they looked so small, I would say they were about uh, over five miles away, uh, I saw two jets heading toward the bombers, and one of them did ram one of the bombers, which in turn careened into uh, uh, another bomber that Major Tollison was uh, flying, and whom I met later on when I was prisoner of war, and he's the one I escaped with uh, later on. Uh, yes, uh, I did see one. Colonel, the question is, what was the total number of combat missions you flew, and what was your final victory tally? Uh, well, I'll tell you in hours, and the hours varied, of course, but I flew 298 or 99 hours. That mission that uh, uh, ground fire shot me down, I was uh, the last mission of my first tour. I had signed up for a second tour and, uh, but I wasn't going to start it until the following mission. And I remember telling my crew chief, this is my last mission. You should never, ever say things like that, because it was. 
So uh, I, I don't recall all of the missions. I just recall the hours. Well, they're down on the record, so I can't miss there. And your final victory tally? Uh, was uh, final victory tally was six and a probable. Six kills and one probable. Yeah, in aerial combat. What was the uh, effectiveness of the ME-262 against the Mustang? And if the German Air Force had had approximately 10 times the number of ME-262s available, how would that have affected the course of the air war? And finally, the third part was, did you ever see the ME-163 Comet airborne in combat? If the jets had been used properly, uh, they would have had a great advantage because of their speed. However, the P-51 could outturn. If you were in a turning fight, you'd win it. If you were in a straight ahead fight, you might lose. The jets did have that advantage. They could appear from almost nowhere, and all of a sudden they were there, and then the next thing, of course, they they were gone. And I chased quite a few, and only caught up with those two. If they had had more, let me tell you, they had many, many uh, ME-262 jets. They were in underground facilities and they'd been building them rapidly. Uh, they literally had over a thousand. They didn't use them, why? Well, uh, they didn't have enough pilots, I guess. Uh, they put their best pilots into the 262s, by the way, and not so much the 163, and I'll tell you about it. Why? For whatever reason, they didn't use them often enough, uh, in my opinion. Again, this is only my opinion. Uh, now, did I see a 163? Yes, I did. I mean, 163 more than once. You'd think you were going to catch up with them. All of a sudden, they'd go straight up, vertically, straight up. <laughs> there was no way you could follow them. And they'd sit up there, and they would glide. And then they would come down very rapidly. And again, they'd, they'd hit the... Uh, they didn't have very much fuel. They had enough fuel to make things a little tough for the bombers. Uh, I don't know of a... 163 that shot down a Mustang. I don't know that, but there may have been. I just don't know it. The 163, also be, be, uh, besides the guns, they also had rockets, uh, missiles in other words, and they would fire at the bombers. And when they did, of course, you'd have a damaged bomber, uh, sometimes fatally, sometimes uh, they were able to get home. The 163 had very volatile fuel, and what they usually did is they flew until the fuel was exhausted or almost exhausted, then they'd go into land. They would take off on a dolly, and the dolly would drop off, uh, and they would uh, go again, go straight up. Now, when they went into land, they would land on skids. Skids would come down, and they always landed on the road, especially in the Autobahn one of the freeways, and they usually waited until the fuel was exhausted because sometimes, well, they're going into land and if they landed with fuel aboard, it could explode. And you know, nobody would get the victory, but they'd have destruction. Colonel, the question mm -hmm. is, can you tell us just a little bit about the day when your airplane was hit by ground fire? Yes, I can. <laughs> I remember that one vividly. <laughs> <laughs> And again, I, I misspoke on that. Uh, it wasn't on the 7th of April to put my jacket out under my seat. It was on the 13th, Friday the 13th. I now stay oh. in bed every Friday the 13th. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was Friday the 13th, and uh, again, it was going to be my last mission on that tour. I was uh, going to fly a second tour. Oh. When I took off again that day, why the sun was shining and I put the uh, jacket under my seat and I had on my brand new shirt. 
we were outlaw squadron, which meant that we could go hunting or look for targets of opportunity. That meant you know, anything that moved you shot at, but especially enemy airfields where there were aircraft parked at the ground and you would go down and destroy as many as you could. We were up near the Baltic Sea in East Prussia and uh, we found a field that was just loaded with aircraft. So we made a pass and uh, we set some of them on fire. I saw four of them go up and fire as I was shooting at them. And I pulled up and I noticed something. There were two batteries that were firing. I didn't see any other guns, so I, I called the flight and I said, I'm on, I found the uh, guns that are shooting at us. I'm gonna go down and take them out and we can set up a traffic pattern and uh, beat up the field. Now, I used to tell my pilots, never ever make a second pass. Well, uh, I did something <laughs> stupid, you know, so I can only blame myself. So I lined up where I could see the two batteries of guns and I went down and I started on the first gun and then all of a sudden uh, all the camouflage came out and there's at least a hundred guns on there. Wow. wow. Now, now, I got, uh, I didn't go across the runway because, uh, you know, they had the guns lined up there. Yes. Uh, so I got down very, very low and I went across the, the field clipping grass, I'm sure. But uh, there were two jets and two 190s, and I fired them, and I saw hits. But at that time, it, it just lit up like a Christmas tree. They were firing everything, 20 millimeters, 40 millimeters. 88s weren't, weren't able to depress enough because I was low yet. I got to the end of the field, and I hopped over the fence, and I was going to stay as low as possible because mm -hmm. the 88 can only be depressed so far. Trees. <laughs> oh, no. Trees. I had no choice. I had to pull up, and as I started to pull up, uh, I was hit. And number one, uh, uh, the oil gauge went down to zero, then a 20 millimeter went into the cockpit, went through the instrument panel, hit the firewall, and exploded there. And, uh, I got a bunch of uh, glass and uh, uh, metal coming toward me. Uh, fortunately, believe it or not, that Bay West helped stop some of them, but I had pieces of, of metal and glass uh, all through my chest and stomach, and some hit my head. Now, no real damage. You know, scalp wound, you bleed a lot, but no real damage. <laughs> But I didn't know that. All I saw was all this blood coming down. And I said, well, I'm hit. <laughs> and they said, yes, you are. <laughs> and they said, did you see that? <laughs> they were saying. But I had the engine still running, so I kept it running oh, for about uh, six or seven minutes to get away from the airfield. And I did. And then uh, they said, Candy, that was my nickname at that time. Who's going to say Candelaria? But they said, uh, you've got a fire. And I said, I know, it's getting real hot in here. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I kept flying. I thought, Let, let's see, I, I need a, a steer to the nearest line. And I knew that Sorby could look at his map before I was trying to keep the engine going. And he gave me a 200 degrees, well, fine. So I sat on 200 degrees. and. Then the engine seized and the propeller stopped. For the propeller stops that uh, 16 inches of flat plate resistance that you have when the propeller becomes, instead of 60, must come 160, I don't know. At any rate, I had to dump the nose at that point and I knew I had to get out. And I told them I'm getting out. So I went over the side and uh, the parachute opened. And, oh, it's so nice, no noise, <laughs> just <laughs> floating down. <laughs> I looked down. The earth is getting bigger and bigger. Uh -huh. So I hit the ground, I spilled the chute, and ran into the woods and buried it and took off. And I was uh, loose for either, either eight or ten days. You know, some said ten days. I, 
I don't know. I didn't have anything to eat for uh, about six days because I had my escape kit, and of course I had those candy bars in there. Good, and that came in handy. Yes, it did. I had. Uh, I found out you could live without food for quite a long time, but you can't live without water. The question is, Colonel, aerodynamically on an ME-262, if one engine was inoperative for whatever reason, malfunction or damage, how would it affect the uh, flight characteristics of the airplane? I would not have maximum performance, obviously. However, it could still, it could still glide. It could still glide and now, both engines were damaged, but one was on fire. The left engine was on fire, and uh, it had other damage. But uh, it could have pulled out and could have survived. Uh, now that I have flown jets, after I flew jets, I realized it would be, you'd have to be a really good pilot. And of course, they put their best pilots into the jets. So it's very possible that uh, you'd be able to go at land. However, the one that I shot down didn't make it to a runway. It had to land in a field, but it, uh, since the hydraulic system was out, it couldn't land on wheels, so it landed wheels up with the engine on fire. They, of course, they put that out. Thank you, Colonel. And that concludes our meeting for today. Thank you for sharing your amazing story. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.